I'm going to demonstrate how the sheet the bear works. I've taken the works out of the box so we can see it better. And the bear is running around the track being chased by the dog. I have it plugged into the amplifier so I can simulate a hit where the bear raises up, turns around, and runs the other direction. I'll show each one of the components to go along in a little bit more detail, and some of them will be in slow motion. One of my favorite pieces of advice is when you buy a new game, whether the previous owner told you it worked or not, don't turn it on. Make it go through its motions by turning the pulley at the bottom. You can see the bear carriage at the upper right. As I turn the pulley, the bear rises up, turns around, and comes towards the left part of the picture. By doing this, you make sure that there's nothing jammed all the mechanics are working through freedom of motion and everything is ready to be turned on. This game has just been newly restored. If it were an old game, you might have to grab hold of the belt or the pulley and turn it by hand by squeezing it. But one way or another, the bear should go through its full range of motion, come back down and go the other direction without having to push very hard. Now it can be turned on. Here I just have the track. Uh, motors on the left. It's got a double reduction pulley and they're cogged belts, so there's very little slippage. Motors turning one direction and can be reversed by the amplifier. Here's the amplifier. The two relays on the left, the one right in the center of the picture, it controls whether the game is on, and the one just behind that controls the direction of the there. When you press down on the far relay on the right, that light makes it look like a hit. And when it hits, then that relay that's on the left in the back will pop in a different direction than the motor reverse. So I'll show the direction of the chain. Unfortunately, videoing the chain, it's hard to tell the direction it's going. Take a look at the pulley, and you can sort of hear it click and hear it go back the other direction. The bear carriage has a sprocket and it's engaged with the chain. As the chain goes around, it pulls along the bear carriage. Not much to it. So I'm going to assemble the part that raises and lowers the bear. First there's an index mark lever that only allows it to go left, right, and to raise up. And then there's a ball bearing race because pressure when the bear raises up is pretty tremendous and so here's a ball bearing and here's the other back side of it and then this is the thing that raises and lowers the bear and you have to make sure that it's facing the right direction the bear is facing this way right now you can tell by this in the lever here this is what raises and lowers it I guess you can't see that oh. here's the part that raises and lowers and so now he's facing backwards which we don't want so we'll raise this and rotate it one notch So now the bear is facing this way. We'll rotate him around, facing the front. And now he's over pointed in this, dir <laughs> this direction. This is the bear carriage. And this is where the bear gets attached up here, up above, closer to the camera. And uh, the railing goes around. Is covering this part of it. And so this thing going up and down is what raises the bear up and down. The interesting thing is that there's a Geneva stop mechanism. And that basically is something that the watch people invented in order to keep you from overwinding your clock. Um, it also shows up in uh, the photo booth stuff. It advances the film, clicks the shutter, advances the film again. 
So you can look on my website for more information on that. But as the bear comes to a stop, this starts turning, and you notice it's got a ramp, and there's an arm that fits here. So as this ramp goes around, it raises up the bear. So the bear raises up, and he turns so that he faces the player, and then hesitates for a second. Very threatening, with bright red eyes and red mouth. And then goes ahead and turns, and then goes the other direction. And this ramp allows it to go down. So underneath this is a Geneva stop. You'll notice that there's only partial gears here. And there's gears down here with a little spot to hesitate and then another spot to go. So as this turns, it hesitates and then turns the rest of the way, driven by this gear. So it turns back, hesitates for a second, and then turns the rest of the way and lowers down. So again, the bear's moving, being driven by the sprocket. The chain reverses. This comes off. The ratchets lock it in place. This starts turning. The bear goes up on the cam. The Geneva mechanism causes the bear to turn, hesitate, turn the rest of the way, and go down. Meanwhile, this is going to come around and unlock the flaps, the ratchets, so that the bear can move off. Here are three sequences that show the bear carriage in action. Uh, they're slowed down so that you can see the action. The bear is rising up. You can watch its feet as he turns around, hesitates, and then turns around the rest of the way, drops down, and continues to run, all actuated by that big, large circle on the right-hand side. Now you'll be able to see the ratchet valve, the ratchet up in the upper right-hand corner. It locks the bear in place. The bear turns, hesitates, turns the rest of the way, gets down and runs, and you can see the ratchet raise up. There's a little feeler on the gear that rotates right now in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, it's the one that allows the ratchets to engage, and that bump that's coming around right now will push on it and stop it. This final part explains how the bear carriage is locked in place on the track while the bear raises up, turns around, and runs the other direction. If you uh, just reverse the motor and nothing is locking it in place, the bear would probably run around the track backwards. So these are what I call flapper ratchets. They uh, grab onto the little uh, bumps on the track, the nubbins, and they're actuated by this cam that's associated with the rotation of the bear. They're little feeler arms here. Uh, that raise up and lower the little flappers depending on which direction the bear is going and we're about to go. If the bear is adjusted correctly you won't hear any of the rattling of these things. It'll be very quiet uh, when it's running along the track and when it stops it'll actually lock in place. When you install this you have to install it actually when the uh, carriage is mounted on the track. Be very careful to make sure that these are actuated by this cam surface here rather than on top because if you screw it down it'll um, cause problems. So here the bear is running along. Notice that this flapper valve is uh, up. It gets pushed down. Remember the cam that's over on this side of this um, wheel is actuating it. Now the bear is it's locked down. Now the bear is raising up. You can tell by this part. It's rotating around. And now the other flapper valve is raised. And this one will go down and lock the bear in place. And when it's all the way, when the bear is finished completely rotating, then both valves get raised up. They need to make sure that they raise up and clear the, the nubbins. The bear reverses 
gets locked into place by this one. It drops down, grabs the nubbin. The bear raises up, turns around, goes the other direction, and the second belt, the second flapper ratchet gets actuated and raises up, and now the bear is free to run along the track. There are two springs on the bear carriage. The big one on the right counterbalances the weight of the bear so that the cam doesn't have to lift the whole thing. Uh, the small one on the left makes sure that the bear goes down to a running position after it's been raised up so it makes it go horizontal. We haven't talked much about the dog. He has a, his own carriage. He was added to add some spice into the game, uh, add some humor. If you look at the expression, he's got a mean expression as he chases the bear. And here the bear's chasing him and he's desperately trying to get away. He's spring-loaded so that there's a certain amount of movement on him. And there are actually some uh, springs that allow him to appear as if he's jogging. Same kind of sprocket with a clutch. Allow it to turn back and forth and try and keep him headed in a straight direction. There are fenders here to keep his carriage from bumping into the bear carriage. Um, he does tend to get close, especially since the bear carriage seems to slip a little bit on the chain. A tiny bit each revolution when it goes around the corner. Here I've added a portion of the scenery. It actually serves a function in the animation of the animals as well. It's got these little trip wires. They're basically a piano wire that sticks straight out coiled around this screw and then locked down so that it always points in the same direction. A lot of games have, the operators have substituted a metal bar to go across here. These have a tendency to break over time and the operators would substitute the bar. The bad thing about that is it has no give to it, so it's really, really hard on the bears and on the dog and oftentimes you'll see that the uh, bottom of the feet of the bear are extra worn because they're dragging across that. There's a little movement. The front legs and the back legs are both pivoted. They're connected by a cross piece, so when this one goes backwards, that one goes forwards. So as they go across and get tripped by these wires, their feet move and they get, lend some animation. The dog as well will trip and go like this and make it look like he's running. Okay, this is the interior of the gun stand. Up at the top, we have the two coin slides and a coin counter. This is a shot sounder. It makes the big bang sound uh, when the gun sounds. And in the bottom is the typical mechanism that uh, Seberg developed for a lot of their jute boxes. It allows you to put in 25 cent pieces and dimes and be able to have different number of plays. Um, this whole motor here and the gear driven and the contacts that are over here keep count of how much um, money's been put in and therefore how many games need to be played. Clearly there are a lot of coins, uh, a lot of uh, terminals here with uh, wires coming and going. These wires are coming from the amplifier. These wires are what are controlling this box and these wires are going to the gun. Um, this is not uh, standard. This is something that I added to reduce the wear and tear on the uh, light in the gun. It's overstressed. And this is the relay that sends current to the gun. Um, a lot of people will test out their game by holding this down and ex looking to see whether the light is on inside the gun. That quickly burns the light bulb out. They're very expensive, um, uh, around $50 each. I do not recommend that you try the game by pushing this if it's not working. Um, usually the problem is not in this area. This is all pretty simple stuff. This is the inside of the uh, stand for Shoot the Bear. The amplifier would normally be right here in the foreground. A box in the back with a single tube and a uh, what appears to be a light bulb is the growler. It makes the noise for the bear when it raises up growls and goes back the other direction. It uses an amplifier uh, tube and that tube in the front is used to make an oscillating no noise. And It's basically a neon tube. Any neon tube can be used 
Um, I strongly recommend that you never ever touch that chassis or anything else because it's got over 300 volts DC on it when the game is being played. That concludes the demonstration of how the Shoot, for, shoot the Bear works. You can find out more information on my website, the Sands Mechanical Museum. Talked about how the carriage gets driven ahead, how the bear rotates, how he rises up, why they use a Geneva, um, and how the carriage gets locked into place. A separate video will show the game in play, and I encourage you to go ahead and take a look at it.